certainly not with unless there was actually an additional source of radiation or something okay. more significant. All radiological disasters from this perspective are rated on a scale of one to seven. So what we've seen at Fukushima is something similar to what we saw at Three Mile Island three decades uh -huh. ago, which is a level five. Okay. Um, something bigger than that is something like Chernobyl, which is a level seven, where you actually the inner core of a nuclear power plant exposed, which is fortunately, thankfully, not what we saw at Fukushima. Okay. And distance is a, is a big deal, too. Uh, when you, you consider Chernobyl, that's half a world away, and, you know, as far as the jet stream is concerned, because we, it, westerly winds, mm -hmm. so everything blows from the, uh, comes from the west, mm -hmm. and so it gets diluted mm -hmm. over time. Okay. So. Okay, great. That's, uh, that's really interesting and an easy way and an, an absolute um, easy way to understand it. I wish we had it during our news breaks <laughs> and our news packages. We could all put that in one, one and a half uh, minute package there. Um, let's, you know, we're, we're dealing with um, the unknown. I want to move a little bit toward what if, okay? Um, I want to understand how do you, and ask, how do you prepare for the unknown, because things are happening and occurring that are not natural. Um, uh, whether it's man-made, whether it's just nature, uh, it, it's unpredictable. So I want to know uh, and ask, how do you prepare for the unknown? Are we prepared for even an earthquake if something were to happen with our plants, since we have so many? Are we still protected? Let's say the unknown, the unthinkable, the impossible actually happens as we continue to see globally. Um, so I'll ask the first question, are we prepared for the unknown? And if so, how are we prepared? Is so that, is that? I guess what you probably did with that job is, or that comment is you completely encapsulated what my entire job <laughs> takes. So okay. thank you for, uh, and also what it yeah, exactly. Thank you for, for kind of, yeah, thank you for doing an excellent job of really articulating <laughs> what it is that I actually am charged to okay. do for the state of Illinois, which is prepare for uh, those types of things that okay. you can't prepare for. So really the mandate for IEMA is to cover, it's just like FEMA. I mean, that's what we do at the state level is we cover, as we describe it, everything from terrorists to tornadoes and everything in between. So any type of disaster, whether it's man-made or it's natural. So as you mentioned, there are many things that can actually threaten the state of Illinois and it's something that people don't often realize is that we actually sit very close to a major fault line. Mm -hmm. So in this case, it's the New Madrid Fault and the Wabash Fault. Yes. And as it happens, um, for the last two and a half years, we've been preparing for what's called a national level exercise. Mm -hmm. It's run by FEMA and at this point includes nine states participating in it. And we're actually simulating a 7.7 .7 magnitude earthquake okay. on the New Madrid fault line. And this is the 250 miles away, that's where we are? That's correct. Okay. Yeah, we're about 250 miles away okay. from the epicenter of that. New Madrid, okay. Missouri is Thank technically the, the center of mass, if you will, for okay. that particular fault line. And that's, those are the types of things that we have to consider. Now, as you mentioned before, there's actually six nuclear power plants with 11 active um, reactors mm -hmm. as far as the nuclear power generation in the state right. of Illinois. Mm -hmm. The closest one to a fault line is actually the one that you mentioned, which is Clinton, Clinton. which is about 250 miles from that fault line. And that's obviously why we're exercising the way we're exercising okay. now is to simulate what would be the impact of something like that. Ultimately, what we have to do is we have to try and come up with the most unexpected mm -hmm. things that you can imagine. I mean, that's, that's really what we're designed for. So that's why we continue to plan, rehearse, drill, and we try and look at things that either haven't happened before or when you look at the case of the New Madrid fault line, we're actually on the 200th anniversary of the last major earthquake on that fault line, which was in 1811 and 1812. Mm -hmm. And it was powerful enough that it actually reversed the flow of the Mississippi River and rang church bells in Boston. That's a pretty okay. significant wow. earthquake. Yes. <laughs> yes, if you're looking is. at the impact. And, and ultimately, I won't get too far into the science because I'm not the expert. I'm, uh, as you mentioned, there's, there's no doctor at the beginning of my name. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Japan, in one respect, was fortunate simply because you're really talking about whether or not this magnitude of earthquake travels through rock as versus what you see here in Illinois, which is much looser soil. Sure. So those are the that types of things. That could be a challenge, right. right? That could be one of the challenges. And, the, and I would say we are as prepared as we could possibly be for those types of events. We actually drill every six months at each of the power plants. So we rotate through between the six power plants. Mm -hmm. So on it, basically what it comes out to is every six months we're doing a nuclear response exercise at one of those plants. 
Okay. I, if I yes. Could, if okay, I, go ahead. You, you said seven magnitude on the Richter scale. What, what's the, why that magic number? Ultimately, that was the closest estimate that we had of what happened in 1811 and 1812, is they estimated between a seven and an eight magnitude on the, on the Richter scale, which obviously is only one dimension of what you have to consider when you look at an earthquake. What you're really looking for is the g-force of the, the actual impact of the earthquake or the ground speed. And that's what was so significant in Japan and why it resulted in such a humongous tsunami is that the g-forces created by the earthquake were orders of magnitude beyond anything in recorded history. Okay. So that's ultimately what created the biggest problem. So you can have a 7.7 .7 magnitude earthquake that actually doesn't do a whole lot of damage. Okay. Or you can actually have something like you did in New Zealand where you have like a 6.2 magnitude earthquake that does horrific damage because that was the second most powerful earthquake in recorded history. So, so okay. in preparation for um, a, a nine, mm -hmm. would there be any, you know, because I, I, there's been some concern that some of the reactors here in the United States are at seven, and but there, but we have nine. It, it, yeah, that, what is that's it? my understanding yeah. that the uh, Fukushima was designed for eight, right. and all the Japanese ones are designed for eight because that was the biggest recorded. Right. So they were covered according to what might have worked, right. but then something comes along that's even bigger than that. That's exactly right. They were designed to withstand a magnitude 8.0 earthquake and a 30-foot tsunami. So what they got was a 42-foot tsunami and a 9.0 earthquake. So uh, An important point is right. that the difference between 8 and 9 is a factor of 10. One's right. 10 times stronger. Okay. The 9 is 10 times stronger than the 8. Significant okay. order. So that's a lot. And, and on top and of that, the, the, the tsunami, 33 foot, you know, they had prepared. They, they, over 30 years, they built walls to uh -huh. protect themselves from tsunamis. Okay. But because of the, the tectonics, that whole uh, coastline dropped three meters. And so it allowed water to spill over. Okay. So even though, and I, I, I want to ask this question, then I'm going to ask um, Chief Goodwin if he will um, step to the mic because I did want to ask you or have the mic brought to him. But I did want to ask you about the local response um, in, in, in the next question or so. Um, so am I to understand that because we're not under the threat of a tsunami, even though we have reactors that are, have the same design, that we really don't have the same concern because we really don't have to worry about the tsunami, so we can handle an earthquake. We might, but because of the tsunami that you said really was, was what pushed it over, we're still okay, we're going to be okay, or? I would tell you, no matter what, I mean, I can tell you that each of the plants here in Illinois were designed basically to withstand the threats that are most significant to them. So earthquakes is certainly one, um, okay. but obviously some of the distance involved helps insulate those and there's a reason why Clinton is the farthest south that any nuclear power plant was constructed in Illinois. But obviously we have other things to be concerned with. We have uh, floods as an issue. There's a plant in Quad Cities right along the Mississippi River. Uh, okay. We have tornadoes are obviously a concern in Virginia. Mm -hmm. Just saw that uh, within the last 36 hours mm -hmm. that they actually had a tornado wipe out uh, power to that power plant and they're operating on backup diesel yeah. generators right now. So mm -hmm. you bring up a good point that even if we don't have an earthquake of the magnitude, or let's say we do, but we don't have a tsunami threat. Mm -hmm. I think what this has taught a lot of people, especially in my line of work, is that you absolutely have to kind of throw out the book on what you think is the worst case scenario. So in my conversations with, with the governor talking about this, because this is obviously something significant in his mind, is you actually have to start playing the what if game, just like you said. Mm -hmm. What if there was an earthquake and a flood and a tornado, and they all happen simultaneously. Mm -hmm. okay. Those are the types of preparations that you have to make mm -hmm. in order to, to ensure that all those plants are safe and that we have a response that fits those types of needs. Okay, and, and let's move to, um, then from the state to the local, Chief Goodwin, I wanted to ask you, um, let's say the unthinkable does happen. Um, what do we have in place? Do we have um, procedures and processes in, play, in place that we're ready for the unknown? Because you also, my sir, sir, have to prepare for the unknown as well, correct? We've prepared as much as we can. Um, you say the unknown, what is the unknown? Yes. Uh, we can prepare for what we can know we can do. Um, we've got the NIMS training throughout the city and throughout the county, which is the National Incident Management System. So we're all on the same page on the incident. Um, Charleston and Coles County and most of Illinois belongs to a, Ma a Mavis organization. It's a mutual aid box alarm system. 
It covered, started in Northern Illinois years ago. It's covered the state of Illinois, Missouri, Wisconsin, and Indiana now. Um, it's the same <clears throat> system that when we went to New Orleans, when they needed help, Illinois sent the task force down. That's through Mavis. Um, Charleston here, um, mainly composed of Charleston firefighters and MAT team firefighters have the technical rescue teams and also the hazmat team for this area part of Illinois. We cover a huge part of southern Illinois, central Illinois. 